Good morning all. Today some retro microprocessor electronics. So this is a remote control unit. It's got push buttons here um, with coloured stickers. This was for my lighting unit and uh, this would have lit up red, yellow, green and blue 100 watt incandescent uh, reflector bulbs in a big box. It's based on the Z80. Uh, the Z80, unlike a microcontroller, doesn't have any internal uh, peripherals, it's just a sort of logic unit. So you have to have external program memory in the form of EEPROM, let's get in a bit closer. Um, there has to be a clock circuit, so there's a crystal here, uh, 2.4576 megahertz and a chip to build a little crystal oscillator. Uh, there's a divider here which divides the 2.4576 megahertz down uh, by probably 16 times to generate a board rate. If you divide this number down, you get the standard board rates. Uh, there's uh, a logic chip here, a 32, that's uh, OR gates, I believe. There's a chip here that's being used for reset. Um, this is an 8-bit buffer chip, which is being used as an input port for the switches to put the data from the switches onto the data bus at the appropriate moment. And finally, the 8251A here is a UART, Universal Asynchronous Receiver Transmitter, which is basically a serial data chip. So what this did is it sent out sequences of bytes. Um, so for example, if you press the red button, it would send out several bytes. One would be channel, the channel number. Uh, it would also send out the brightness level that you were trying to set the lights to. Now these were set to take the lights up to full brightness, so that would be fixed at maximum, uh, the speed at which you want the uh, lamp to climb up in brightness. Uh, it calculated the speed based on where the lamp currently was and where it was going and it did a little uh, division to calculate that. And uh, the black button here is for all lamps off. Now I would quite like to power this up, it's not been powered up for many years, and uh, see if I can scope the output and see if uh, we can see the serial data coming out and make uh, make any sense of it. Now, of course, this is just the remote control. This is the uh, input end of the system. It's part of a much bigger system. So let's take a look at the other components. Uh, here, very dusty, because it hangs on my wall, is another Z80-based uh, microprocessor system, which is the main lighting controller. Uh, this has changed over the years, but this is the input, so the output of the uh, transmitter unit the remote control unit would be connected through to the input of this unit. This had uh, Z80, ROM, RAM. This unit doesn't actually have any RAM. Uh, this has a counter timer chip. All modern microcontrollers have built-in counters and timers. The Z80 doesn't. You had to have an external chip. Another UART here. Again, microcontrollers have UARTs built in typically. And this is a parallel input-output uh, chip which provides ports because Z80 has no parallel ports, so you had to have a chip for those. This one's clearly an output, there's a driver chip there. This one's an input, and there are DIL switches, which are obviously for uh, function, different function selections. Now, also part of this system were the uh, lamp driver boards, which consisted of uh, eight triacs, a couple of transistors. These are BC108s, and um, these are opto isolators. I've actually got three of these triac boards in various stages of disassembly. And then later on came another version of the TRIAC lamp driver board with a, a more logical layout, eight uh, channels, but also the zero crossing detector, because one of the things that this unit needed was uh, to know where the main cycle was. So this transformer produces a, a signal which blips this opto isolator probably a hundred times a second. So every time the mains waveform crosses zero, 50 hertz of course it is in this country, it would uh, send a signal to the microprocessor, probably on an interrupt input, and then this could sequence all of the uh, lighting control to the mains waveform. Now, as you can see, this was a really massive project. A lot of hardware went into this. A lot of software went into the uh, writing of the code for these uh, various modules. It probably spanned about 15 years. It was never finished. It only really ever had one proper outing where we used it at a film show to just provide ambient lighting. Um, 
it uh, just eventually ran out of steam because it became too old. The technology was superseded. The Z80 became uh, old and unloved. And so uh, here it is, just hanging on the wall. But I'm just going to uh, remove this board from its uh, chipboard base. I seem to have stolen some of the pillars from this. It's only now sitting on two of these support pillars. It's all become very warped because uh, this is just a uh, Vero board resin bonded paper type. So I'm just going to take this off and take a look at the wiring style because although you can see there's um, a little bit of wiring on the top, uh, these orange wires coming from the switches to the input port and a few wires going to chip selects and clock and all that sort of stuff, the main data and address buses are actually wired underneath. So here's the underside of the board. Uh, the Z80 is here, the uh, EEPROM is here, the UART is there, and then the uh, input port, the little LS244 chip is there. And it's all wired with this Vero wire. Now it looks like enameled copper wire, and it sort of is, but the enamel is designed to burn off um, at soldering temperature. So you wrap it around these pins, I'll get in a bit closer in a minute, and then just solder it, the enamel burns off, and it makes a connection. But you use these plastic combs, you lay them out into the uh, holes on the Vero board, and then you run your wires, and then there are lots of them on here, all uh, eight data lines linking all these chips, and then linking the microprocessor to the EEPROM, there are address lines, probably 12, 13, 14 of those, uh, all wired around these combs. Let's get in a little bit closer. So here you can see uh, kind of how it works. You just wire the wires, you run the wires along the combs and then round uh, an anchor point and onto the pin that you're uh, trying to connect to. So uh, here are all the data and address lines of the EEPROM, for example, and then go a bit further and we've got all the lines, just the data lines, it looks like uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. So eight data lines onto the UART and then uh, also eight data lines onto the input port and this particular chip the LS244 is really horrible input four of the inputs are on one side and four of the inputs are on the other so you can see um, outputs are where my enamel copper wire goes one two three four five six seven eight I think there or maybe it's down there yeah it's down there that one there so this is very much a hybrid bore of this uh, board of this um, thick um, single core wire, insulated wire on the top, and the Vero wiring on the bottom. Now there are several different ways that you can wire a microprocessor board. On this one I decided to go with these hoops of wire that simply just jump over the top of the uh, various components, microprocessor, EEPROM, RAM, counter timer chip, UART, PIO, and then my ULN2803 driver chip. Uh, just a complete rat's nest of wires very dusty now because as i say this hangs on my wall now these triac driver boards uh, you can see are hand drawn so these would have been drawn with a dalo etch pen and that's a bit like a felt tip which just deposits ink onto the copper um, which sets hard like a sort of lacquer and then uh, when you dip the board into ferric chloride which is a chemical that eats copper it takes away all the copper that's not coated in this lacquer and then once it's all washed and dried you can rub the lacquer off with alcohol or something like that, carbon tetrachloride or something of that uh, type and you're left with your finished board with the exposed copper tracks but uh, you can see very clearly that it's hand drawn now this one I think has my logo of the time on it, JAD, Julian's Audio Design not quite sure why I went for that because I did Quite a few other things than just audio but uh, the date is September or possibly uh, August 1984. Now by 1990 things had moved on a bit and I was actually using uh, graphic design software to uh, produce my printed circuit boards. So you can see that these are neatly labelled with my name September 1990. Uh, some quite fine tracking running down into this uh, dual in line IDC insulation displacement connector, uh, thick tracks for the uh, high voltage stuff, transformer is here. Uh, interestingly I noticed on here 
I slightly miscalculated because there was no 3D CAD at the time and uh, the transformer slightly interfered with the uh, socket there, the main socket, and I had to do a little bit of sawing to produce a little cutout. Interesting. Now it appears that I called this uh, program in here, the software Mini TX1 for my Mini Z80 based transmitter, and I've actually found the software in an old box of floppy disks. Here it is. It's a five and a quarter inch floppy disk uh, nicked from where I used to work, well borrowed let's say, uh, from Linotype and uh, the code for this chip is on here. Now it's not in any recognizable uh, disk format because at the same time as developing all this I was playing around with uh, disk drive read and write routines so I invented my own uh, coding format and uh, that's what I used on here. Whether or not I could uh, ever read this again, mm, well that's open to question. So in my big box of wires I found a BNC to BNC, so that should work for uh, connecting the uh, module to the scope. So that's the uh, BNC output connected into my scope. Now powering this might be a bit tricky because this was obviously designed to have um, an AC transformer connected in on this two pin connector. There's then a bridge rectifier and smoothing capacitor and a 5 volt regulator, but of course that doesn't stop me putting sort of 8 volts or so DC in on here. The bridge rectifier won't do anything, um, or it might flip the DC round. Then it'll be regulated and then this thing should power up and we should be able to see if we can get some of these uh, serial bytes uh, on the scope. So I'm just going to plug some 8 volts of DC into there. So I've set my favorite power bank to uh, eight volts output, and I'm hoping I can just get this plug and uh, wedge it in between these pins here. Let's see whether it likes this. Probably need to put a clip on there, but yes, the power bank is now showing that it's having current drawn. So yeah, I think with a clip on there, that's going to work. Now, is anything coming up on the scope? Oh yeah, there's something there. Let's have a closer look. So I've uh, set my scope to capture uh, one sequence of uh, data coming out when I press the red button. And uh, it looks to me like there are possibly four bytes there. But let's first see if we can work out the board rate. Uh, I'm just going to widen that out, turn it so that it fits on the display. Where's the trigger point? There's the trigger point there. So let's widen it out one more and uh, try and work out how many bits there are per second. Now the time base is one millisecond per division. So we've got about two bits. That's the start bit. It idles high and then the start bit goes low. That's followed by what looks like three high data bits. Uh, but we've got one to possibly a bit more than two bits per millisecond. So it's a bit more than 2000 bits per second. So my guess is that it's 2400 board, 2400 bits per second. Now, if on my calculator I do two times 2400 board equals 4800, 9600 board, 19.2, These are recognizable board rates. Um, and if I keep going, I eventually get to uh, 2,2.4576. And of course, as we saw earlier, if I can get it in shot, the crystal is 2.4576 uh, megahertz. So the 2400 board certainly seems plausible. Now if I press the uh, colored buttons, so red, 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 yellow, 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 green, 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 blue, 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 you can see the very first part, the very first byte changes, but subsequent bytes don't. So red is that, yellow is that, red, yellow, you can see the bit of the code that changes, red, yellow, green, blue, red, yellow, green, blue, and black puts out that code, which is obviously all lamps off. 
but I still haven't quite managed to decode what the rest of it is yet. So it's quite nice to see that uh, this thing still works after all those years. This was probably built uh, mid-1990s, so this is uh, 20 years old. Still runs, the code is still in the EEPROM, that still works. Now, of course, this was intended as a quick and dirty uh, fade up red, fade up yellow, fade up green, fade up blue, or even you could press all four buttons and it would fade all of them up and then fade them all back out. But the uh, main input device, and we have seen this before, um, was this. This is also for the lighting unit. And the idea is that you'd hold down a button or sets of buttons. You could hold down, you know, all four of the first four buttons and then raise the brightness of lamps using this wheel. And the wheel has this optical uh, encoder disc on it and a couple of um, opto sensors with uh, LEDs and opto diodes or transistors, little uh, buffer chip there. And then it would detect uh, the direction of travel of this wheel, either forwards or backwards, to raise the level of the lights that you pressed or lower the level of the lights that you pressed. And then there are going to be various other functions on here for bringing up groups of lights. And uh, well, as you can see, the buttons aren't labeled. So I never quite got around to uh, working out fully what this thing would do, but the hardware was built. So a little glimpse there into the world of the uh, Z80 microprocessor. Um, quite a difficult chip to use because it needed so much uh, support logic around it to get it to do even the most basic of things. I mean, um, a single microcontroller could do all of this now. Um, although the Z80 actually was uh, somewhat easier to use than other microprocessors because it only required one power supply, just 5 volts. There were microprocessors that predated this that needed all sorts of horrible voltages like minus 5 and plus 12 and that sort of thing. And in fact, even this uh, Z80 microprocessor circuit could be replaced with a single microcontroller because even all the clock circuits, the reset circuits, the board rate generators and uh, the counter timers and parallel input output ports and UART, all of this would be in a single microcontroller chip these days. But I have great fondness for the uh, Z80 CPU because that's where I learnt all my assembly language programming skills all those years ago. Cheerio.